Hey, what's up guys? So I get asked often about workplace politics and networking and you know, even navigating your own social circles and how can I most tactfully navigate the situation in such a way that I get what I want, but I don't rub people the wrong way. That's a great question. And I think that in all of the above situations, there is usually an optimal personality type that yields the best results for the individual. That personality type actually, it comes from an interdisciplinary analysis across multiple different fields of study. In this particular case, game theory, computer science, and evolutionary biology. So there's some really interesting findings here and it all points to like one unique personality type that I think has the highest win rate in all these sort of social situations. So I'm gonna explain that in this video. To start out with the background, right? I'm gonna have to explain Prisoner's Dilemma. And for those of you who already know about Prisoner's Dilemma, it's a pretty basic game theory case study. You can skip to the next chapter. I broke this video down into chapters, but otherwise I'll explain that here. Prisoner's Dilemma is basically a famous case where, let's say two prisoners are caught trying to break into an ATM or something like that. And the cops pull them in, they get captured. The cops suspect that they're also the same criminals that are behind a much bigger crime, like robbing a bank a year ago, but they got away with it. So cops have this plan where they separate the two criminals into different rooms and interrogate them. And they offer both criminals the same deal. The deal is if you snitch on the other guy and confess that you robbed that bank a year ago, then they'll get three years prison time and you'll get zero years prison time. And both criminals are given this deal. And so they're they're hoping that they snitch on each other. But if they both snitch on each other, then they both get two years prison time. There's four, four potential outcomes that can happen. They both don't snitch on each other and they both serve one year prison time for trying to break into the ATM machine. And that's the best case scenario for both of them if they both stay loyal to each other. The other two scenarios are basically if one criminal snitches on the other. And then the last scenario is if they both snitch on each other, then they both serve two years prison time. What ends up happening in the situation is that a lot of people just snitch because they think, well, that's what's best for me. You know, if you navigate your life uh, with self-interest in mind, that, that would seem to be the most rational thing to do. But, you know, it turns out just cooperating and being loyal actually yields the better the better return of one year prison time. And so it's a famous example. But where it gets more interesting is when you iterate the prisoner's dilemma. So there's a thing called the iterated prisoner's dilemma, which is if you could be in the same situation again with the same person, and it's a game, right? Then how would you handle it? Is there a strategy you could use that would minimize your prison time served. So you, so you end up in a situation and you take an action. Okay, I'm gonna snitch or okay, I'm, I'm gonna be loyal. And then you have a memory in the iterated prisoner's dilemma of what the other criminal chose to do, whether they snitched on you or whether they didn't. So it opens up all these different strategies of how to deal with that. And it just keeps iterating. Game theorists ha have a lot of different opinions on what would be the best way to handle that. And so this professor, Robert Axelrod from the University of Michigan in the 1980s, he hosted an iterated prisoner's dilemma tournament and invited all of these prominent game theorists to submit their code and they would all compete in the tournament. And your code is basically like your bot where your bot represents you as a prisoner and your bot competes with the, with the other entrance bots. And so you will compete against each other and you try to serve the least amount of prison time in the end. And whoever scores the lowest prison time in the end is the winner of the tournament. So as you can imagine, you know, all these smart people apply to the tournament and they come up with all these like really complicated algorithms where they're trying to find patterns in the behaviors of the other prisoner and you know oh is this guy gonna snitch on me you know this guy's more vindictive or you know and people people had theories like well you, you just have to be more evil if you're more aggressive and snitching on the other person on average you'll serve less prison time you know, things like this and some people had the opposite slant where they'd say well no you have to be way more nice if you're nice other people will detect that and so people had all these theories and some of some of the algorithms they submitted were like super complicated, like thousands of lines of code. And so they ran the tournament and to to everyone's surprise, the winner of the whole tournament was this one really simple algorithm that was four lines of code. That's now called the tit for tat strategy or the tit for tat algorithm. And the gist of the algorithm is whatever they did the last round, you do it back to them. That's why it's called the tit for tat strategy. It's actually incredibly simplistic. While all these other algorithms are attempting to find patterns in your behavior and they, they, they run off all these complicated ideas, 
The tit for tat strategy is very straightforward. In analyzing the tit for tat strategy, there are four main points that describe its actions because it's just four lines of code. The first point is you start out by giving them the benefit of the doubt. You start out by being nice. You say, I'm not going to snitch on you. And then you hope that they start out nice too. And if you both are nice to each other, then you end up in this virtuous cycle where you both are like, all right, this is a good groove. We're never going to snitch on each other. And you both serve very little prison time. The second point is that you, you have a spine and you're willing to stand up for yourself. What happens if you both are not snitching on each other is the other algorithm usually detects, well, I can probably get away with snitching on this guy at some point because then I can serve less prison time and I can take advantage of him. If the other criminal tries to snitch on you, you're willing to stand up for yourself and and you'll snitch back on them. You'll continue to do that as long as they keep snitching on you. Point three is that you're willing to forgive. If you end up in that cycle where you're both snitching on each other, now you're both serving two years prison time during each round. And that's not really optimal either. The other algorithm of the other criminal at some point might say, okay, 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 sorry. I won't snitch on you, okay? Let's go back to the harmonious, virtuous cycle we had before. And you can't hold a grudge here. You can't say, no, you had your chance. One strike, you're out. What you have to do is you have to be willing to forgive because it's better for you. By being willing to forgive, to say, okay, fine, you want to you go back to not snitching? All right, I won't snitch either. Then you can get back into the harmonious cycle again. And point four is basically, you're, you're very straightforward and honorable about how you do things, how you live your life. In this case, you're just saying, I'm a nice person. I'll treat you with respect if you treat me with respect. But don't try to exploit me because I will stand up for myself. But if you apologize and you make a mistake, we can go back to being friends. And so those four lines of code, if you had to extract a personality out of those four lines of code, it would be summarized by those four points that I just made. And they've since had other versions of the iterated prisoner's dilemma where they change certain vari variables around or the, the length of the cycles that it can iterate is completely variable. And people have had time to try to try to exploit the tit for tat strategy. And the tit for tat strategy still wins no matter what. It's, it's actually so elegant and beautiful that this simplistic strategy, it, it, it's, it's like a secret of the universe that it, this simplistic strategy can't be beaten by, by way more complex, sophisticated algorithms. It, it, it just down to the core of it. It's it's the most optimal personality type to serve the least amount of prison time in these sort of scenarios. In the field of evolutionary biology, they looked at these iterated prisoners' dilemmas and they found that in the animal kingdom, these scenarios that look and behave a lot like iterated prisoners' dilemmas, they come up naturally all of the time. In this field, they call it reciprocal altruism. I'll walk through a couple of examples of reciprocal altruism in the animal kingdom. So there are bats that have to try to survive a harsh winter and they're all just kind of chilling in these clusters on the side of the cave. So the question is, what is the optimal strategy for survival as a bat? And so what happens is every now and then a worm will come crawling down and as a bat, you, you know, you're starving. So you just want to gobble up the whole worm. Counterintuitively, that's not the best strategy for survival because what happens is if you eat the whole worm, you'll feel good at that time, but you might not get lucky and have another worm pass you in another two or three weeks. And then you might starve to death in that time. So the more superior strategy actually is to share the worm with all the bats around you. Just take a piece of it and then share it with all the bats around you. And the bats around you will remember that. And so when they catch a worm, they'll eat a piece of it and share it with you. And so your odds of surviving the harsh winter are much better if you can get a small piece of a worm like once a week. The likelihood of that happening are higher because now you have an entire network of bats around you that will share with you as long as you share with them. The, the bats that choose the selfish route and gobble up the whole worm themselves, the bats around them remember that and say, bro, if I get a worm, I'm not sharing it with you either. And so, you know, this, this idea of reciprocal altruism in the animal kingdom is, is the same concept as the tit for tat strategy in the iterated prisoner's dilemma. And another example is with red winged blackbirds. So these birds will not only protect their own nest, but they'll protect the nest of their neighbors from predators. And in doing that, they also expect those blackbirds to protect their nest when they're off hunting. And so they always have the nests covered where some of them are hunting and others of them are protecting the nests. By building this this wider network with their neighboring blackbirds, their odds of survival are higher than just being selfish. So it's another example of reciprocal altruism. And the last example I'll go through is just primates. Primates 
will groom and pluck bugs out of their friend's fur and they're preventing them from getting diseases or infections or things like that. And so it's it's literally like a you scratch my back, I scratch yours. And so the, the other primate will do that for them. There's reciprocal altruism there too. And so finally we get to humans, right? And I think you see examples of it in your life. In my own personal workplace politics, I'm all about building really good alliances with people because I understand that you, you need to have people in your corner looking out for you. You need eyes and ears in different places so that you have access to the best information as things evolve in, in the firm. So there are going to be situations where you might have to stay late sometimes to help out another team, but that's not just doing them a free favor. You're expecting them to return the favor. And that's, I think that's what a lot of like selfish people don't understand because you'll run into people in the workplace who are just ruthlessly selfish. And, and they don't seem to get this concept. They think, oh, I, I, I'm just doing what's best for me. This is going to be optimal for my career. But counterintuitively, I don't think it is. I think to, to move up, you need the alliances and the support of your peers. And you need heads of other groups to think that you're going to be able to benefit them if, you, if you're given power. And so playing well with others is actually valuable. <laughs> for your own gain. That's that's the part selfish people don't understand. If your goal is your own selfish gain, it is superior to be strategically unselfish at times to yield the best results to get what you want selfishly. And I think a lot of people, they haven't thought that deeply about how, how to play the, the workplace games, the, the strategies in the games. And it's not just workplace, it's with anything, right? With networking or things like that. Like, why would you just, if you just go up to someone and say, hey man, can I get a job at your prestigious company? Like, why would they, why would they be okay with that? You, you have to offer something, right? You know, take them out to dinner somewhere nice. Try to find a way to help them and then say, you know, I, I also hope in a way you can help me, you know? But try, try to see it from their perspective. What, what are they gaining by helping you out? So you always want to kind of see things from that framework. And it applies to all, all the way down to just interpersonal relationships with your own social circles. You know, you don't want to be that jerk in your social circle that people don't like. You want to be a person that others feel there's mutual benefit in hanging out with you. And you'll notice that that's going to help you. Forgiving your enemies. I think for a lot of people that's difficult, but I'm reminded by a quote by Michael Corleone when he says, never hate your enemies. It clouds your judgment. To have the power and strength to forgive your enemies, it actually net benefits you. You know, it might not feel natural to you. Nobody benefits from having a lot of enemies. You're better off having alliances with friends, even if you can't fully trust them, to at least formalize a friendship again and, and to have the willingness and flexibility to find mutual gain in people that were once enemies. That personality type gets further in the game of life. And I think you see that in geopolitics as well. Willing to say to your geopolitical enemies, okay, well, we hate each other, but we can still trade natural gas with each other, right? You know, like <laughs> finding places where you can mutually benefit, even with your enemies, is beneficial to both of you. And I think that the game theorists that advise on foreign policy for our political leaders fully understand this. And that's how we end up in these situations where we are geopolitical rivals with countries that we still do business with. So yeah, I'll leave it at that and uh, let, let me know your thoughts in the comments. Take care.